and from the background, we don't get the whole infinity thing going. <laughs> All right. Thank you for braving the horrible winter conditions here in December, Florida. <laughs> I, I think there were a few drops. I had to use my windshield wipers. Um, you know, it's just, just be careful out there. Uh, it's a little different than when I lived in Baltimore, uh, mm -hmm. but this is a little bit more like what I was used to in San Diego when I grew up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's get down to work. Uh, we are continuing in Ediot, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, which is always possible, um, because you know I, I review them and sometimes I forget which one we got up to, uh, but I believe we were on Ediot chapter two, Mishnah six, because um, I, I'm very sure that we completed number five. That's what I remember too. Good. All right, so good. My, my memory's not faulty yet, I don't think. Uh, so um, we don't have our usual volunteer who loves to read uh, and does it in such a uh, emphatic and uh, and beautiful way. So that means we're uh, going to have to go back to uh, just round robin, uh, which is what we've done, which is we take turns, which everyone is always permitted to say pass if you really don't like reading in front of other human beings. Uh, but we'll start on my left and... Just read if you're happy, and when you read, you'll read a whole Mishnah uh, interrupted by me as usual. <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready? Yes. Okay. Rabbi Ishmael said three things, and Rabbi Akiva disagreed with him. Okay. <laughs> One, garlic or unripe grapes or green ears of grain were being crushed on the Eve of Shabbat. And, why it is, and while it is yet day... All right. Let's make sure we understand the situation here. Uh, the... the um, uh, Garlic uh, or, or the, the the grapes are probably things that you'll be most uh, familiar with. But first of all, a reminder that um, squeezing on Shabbat is prohibited, right? If uh, if I'm at home and I've got some lovely grapes and I would like to drink them, I can't hold them over the cup and go and, and squeeze them into my cup. Uh, partly because it's messy, but but also because that act of squeezing is forbidden on Shabbat. Lots of details about that. Any good book on halakha will help guide you about exactly what types of squeezing is okay, what types of squeezing are not okay. Someone at the door? Yay. Um, but in general, squeezing is not permitted on Shabbat. So the question then becomes, if I've set up pre-squeezing, what happens? And pre-squeezing in the ancient time is something that we're not so familiar with, right? Because for now, nowadays, when we want to squeeze something, you know, we get out our orange squeezer or we get out our gar garlic press or things like that. In the ancient world, it was a little different. Uh, let's see if I can draw this. This is a kind of vat, and you would put your produce things in here, and then it would depend. You would either have just heavy weight that you would set on top, and that weight would just squish the things underneath it. And that process would just keep going and going and going. The other way that sometimes these were set up, um, you would have a, a turn screw, and you would tighten it down as tight as you could make it, and then that would set it to squeezing. And then you'd have a little spigot over here and your bucket. Oh, yeah, we had a whole mission now. Yep. And so that would start filling it up. But the problem is, Shabbat-wise, is you start the squeezing, but the dripping is not going to complete right away, right? This is not a light switch. You, you go, and it, the weight is there, and it's pushing down, pushing down, and little bits are dripping out, little bits are dripping out, little bits are dripping out. So the question is, if I began this during the day, which it's not Shabbat yet, so I'm allowed to do that Friday afternoon, am I allowed to continue to reap the benefits, right? If I've got my lovely garlic juice over here, can I skim that off on Shabbat and use it? Or am I not allowed to skim that off because that's like squeezing uh, and therefore not allowed to use it? Good. We got the setup? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Rabbi Ishmael says... <laughs> he may finish brushing it after it grows better. Right? Meaning that, yes, even though this has already begun, he may finish. And finish here doesn't mean making it crush more. Finish here means taking the juice from the crushing things that were begun before Shabbat. Uh, he, he, the question could also even be if he crushed it and, and then he had most of it drained, if he was to sort of sop up a little bit of extra, let's say he had his garlic press going, if he was dabbing at the extra bits of juice that were still leaking out afterwards, 
Rabbi Yishmael says, yes, he is allowed to do that. However, Rabbi Akiva says, he may not finish. Right. So you're not allowed to do the crushing, squeezing on Shabbat, and you're not allowed to benefit from the additional things that are squeezed out on Shabbat, even if you didn't begin it on Shabbat, um, and which is uh, where we eventually end up. Make sense? All right. So again, not every uh, testimony in Ediot is especially inspiring, uh, but that's uh, that's where we are right now. Okay. Should we move on to two seven, or we have questions about that one? They never came to a conclusion. Um, <laughs> remember, if you want conclusions, you have to go read Halakha, uh, or you can read the Talmud where they discuss it in more detail. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, the conclusion does follow Rabbi Akiva in in most of these cases. All right, two seven. Yep. They said three things before Rabbi Akiva: two in the name of Rabbi Elizar and one in the name of Rabbi Joshua. Two in the name of Rabbi Elizar. A woman may go out on the Sabbath adorned with a golden city. All right. What in the world are we talking about? So this was apparently a very common jewelry style. So. Back up again, we're still talking about Shabbat issues here, uh, at least for this first one. Um, on Shabbat in the ancient world, uh, women were not allowed to wear jewelry. Right? In, in classical um, Jewish communities uh, in antiquity, um, women would not go out with earrings or necklaces and such. The, the, the reason was that they were very likely to want to show them to other people, and that would involve taking them off and showing them, and then they might not put them back on, and that means they would be carrying them in the public domain, and carrying in the public domain is forbidden. So as a precaution to keep people from wearing things that aren't really necessary, it's not like I'm gonna forget to put my shirt back on, um, but jewelry I might, they said just don't wear jewelry on Shabbat because you're likely to come to carry it. Okay, you don't have to agree about the logic of this or even the likelihood of this, this was something that they felt was prevalent in the ancient world. Here, Rabbi Eliezer is saying that this special like diadem that used to have like the, the skyline of Jerusalem um, in gold was allowed. That he was saying this is a special exception. Now, he said it's a special exception because the only people who wear that are the people who can afford to wear that. And the people who afford, can afford to wear that are not going to be showing it around like it's some trinket. Right? This is not, oh, look what I got for swap mate. Uh, this is, oh, yeah, fancy and hands off. And so therefore, we wouldn't worry that it wouldn't uh, be put back on if it was even taken off. Uh, I should point out here, when you wanted to know what the conclusion was, uh, the halakha actually goes against that position. And even that, uh, they were not allowed to wear. All right, totally new topic, number two. <laughs> and they that fly pigeons are unfit to bear evidence. So this is something we came up uh, on when we were studying uh, Sanhedrin. Um, and the idea here of flying pigeons is not pigeon fanciers. Uh, these are pigeon racers. Uh, and this was uh, a gambling issue. So if somebody is a gambler, then their testimony was considered to be suspect and more likely to be compromised. As we talked about a little bit in Sanhedrin, this is um, primarily because if somebody is a, uh, a gambler, then they are very likely to be um, in need of additional funds, uh, either to fuel their gambling addiction or to pay off gambling debts. Uh, and either way, it makes it very easy for someone to uh, buy their testimony. And so, for uh, for these pigeon uh, racers, their testimony was considered illegitimate. He got his own copy. So uh, I should also point out in Sanhedrin, there's also the opinion that these pigeon folk were people who would go out into the fields and attract other people's pigeons and have their pigeons lead them back to their um, dovecotes. It was a way of stealing other people's pigeons. Um, <laughs> Well, because pigeons would go out and then they would come home and there were techniques of helping other people's pigeons come back to your home, which is a lot less uh, work than stealing into someone else's house <laughs> and trying to steal their pigeons in a sack. Um, so, but either case, the, the people were involved in activity that were likely to uh, make their testimony quest questionable. Make sense? Onward. 
<clears throat> if there was a creeping thing in the mouth of a weasel when it walked over loaves of Turuma, and it is doubtful whether it touched them or whether it did not touch them, that about which there is doubt remains pure. Okay. Another drawing. <laughs> so. It was last week, right? Hmm? Purity, we, we've talked about a little bit last week. Yes. All right. So you got a loaf. That, that's as good as I can do for a loaf. <laughs> and on top, oh, sorry, and the loaf is truma. Uh, truma, you may remember, is uh, something that was given to the, uh, the Kohanim as a gift, and it has to be eaten while the Kohen is in a pure state. And that means the food itself also has to be in a pure state, uh, ritually pure. So this loaf was probably made with flour that someone had given, or maybe the loaf had already been made, but most likely it was just with the flour. So I've got a loaf that's made with truma. The priest is required to eat it in purity. The loaf is required to remain pure. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. On top of it, yeah, you try and draw a weasel. <laughs> <laughs> On top of it, you got a weasel. Okay. <laughs> now, that in and of itself, what? It's longer than a cat. It's longer than a cat. And, and the legs are a little shorter. Yeah. I think that's not bad for a weasel. <laughs> I mean, granted, if I were to draw that on the wall, you wouldn't walk in and go, look, a weasel. But in context, <laughs> it's, symbolic. It's, it's, an icon, it's an icon of a, of a weasel and, and not drawn to scale. Most loaves are not smaller than the weasel. But so you got a loaf and a weasel takes a walk across it. Uh, now, Weasels were not um, always pests. Sometimes weasels were kept as mousers. You would have a weasel to, to get the rodents that were infesting your property. So having a weasel in your house is not that unusual. A modern, a modern statement might be like having a cat, right? You got a cat in your house, you all probably know, uh, cats go where they want. Uh, so you've got some warm loaves out, the cat's probably gonna walk across them because they know you don't want them to. Uh, <laughs> but here is the twist. You have in its mouth, let's say, a dead lizard, uh -huh. right? Now, a dead lizard on the loaf, and eh, the loaf is gone, right? It is now ritually impure, and, and we're done. A dead lizard not on the loaf, no problem. But if the weasel just brrr, scampers across the loaf, did the lizard touch the loaf or not? Right. Did you see? If you see it touch and you're sure it touched, then this isn't relevant. We know that it's 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 out. But if we're not sure, what's the ruling? Right. And that is where we continue. I think I interrupted you before we got to the doubtful part, didn't I? No, I think the remains pure. Okay. Okay. So we got all the way through it. Right. So if it's doubtful whether it touched, and it's doubtful whether it didn't touch them. So we saw them run. And we saw the weasel carrying the lizard, but we didn't see if there was contact, right? So we're sort of like, ah, then it, the loaf is still considered to be ritually pure. Why? Because in cases where there is um, only temporary contact, right, we are more lenient. And in a case of doubtful temporary contact, we are always going to err on the side of leniency. Again, if we know that it came into contact, then the ruling would be different. But if we're not sure, because it just went foom, like weasels do, uh, I presume, uh, then, <laughs> then we have to say that the loaf is still fine, the Kohen can still eat it, and everything is um, hunky-dory. What's this leniency for temporary contact? Mm -hmm. I don't remember that. What, how does that work? Oh, we don't remember. It is not something that we come up with daily. So. Um, I'm trying to remember if it was five this second. the five second rule. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to remember whether it's actually talked about this. Oh, yeah. So it is in this commentary. Uh, so that's helpful, right? Uh, so this is due to a general rule that if a source of impurity is moving and it is doubtful whether it touched anything, the thing it might have touched remains pure. Right. Um, no, but you said temporary. Well, that's that's what I mean by oh. by by moving, right? If if it was moving. And you're not sure whether it actually touched, right? There's there's a dead lizard flying near a, a piece of bread. I, I don't know whether it actually touched or didn't touch, right? If it fell on the bed uh, on the bread, maybe like uh, trying to think of another um, weird hypothetical. Uh, there's a, a dead lizard 
it, it falls off the ceiling and I'm not sure whether it hit the loaf of bread or not, right? It may have hit it and then fallen off or maybe it just fell off, right? That would be a different, uh, a different uh, case to analyze. But in this case, because it's got its own jetpack, its own weasel, uh, we know that it's moving and we, we don't know whether it touched. So <coughs> the loaf is still good to eat. Uh, with that, we move on to 2.8. Yes. Excuse me. Okay. Rabbi Akiva declared three things. About two, they agreed with him. And about one, they disagreed with him. All right. So we're going to get some general agreement and one specific case of no. About a lime burner's sandal, that it is liable to contract Midras impurity. All right. So um, you may remember that a Midras impurity is uh, the kind of impurity that is departed by a Zav. That's someone who had a um, leakage from the genitals in the non-normal facet fashion, um, an irregular discharge. Um, and the question here is not about the type of impurity they may have. The question here goes back to our discussion of chairs uh, from a number of sessions ago, which is when is a chair a chair? And here the question is when is a shoe a shoe? Um, these particular types of sandals that were worn by the line burners were they were like um, like work clogs. You didn't wear them just to go walking down the street. You didn't wear them in any other circumstances. They were almost like um, stilts. Uh, not, not that they were super high, but they were just there to let them work amongst the line that they were burning. Um, they weren't worn because they were fashionable footwear. Um, it's like, um, have you seen those uh, shoes you can get at Home Depot that have the spikes on the bottom to aerate your, uh, your lawn, right? No one actually wears those things because they're just cool. You, you wear them to do a job. So the question is, is this actually a tool kind of, or is this a real piece of footwear? If it's a real completed, authentic man-made footwear item, then absolutely it can contract impurity. If it's just something people strap to their feet to get the job done and not really an object that can contract impurity, then it remains pure. His opinion is that as unusual and as rare as these particular types of sandals are, they nonetheless count as being actual shoes and therefore they can contract ritual impurity. Make sense? Why, why can't tools contract ritual impurity? Uh, some of the tools can, but natural, natural materials can't. And the question is always, when does an object go from being natural material to being man-made object? So some tools like a stick or you know a board um, would not be. These were apparently, I didn't live back then, very similar to just boards that had been lashed to the feet with a bit of a riser uh, built onto the bottom. So the question is whether those really count as shoes or whether those count as bits of wood that you've tied to your foot for a while. And, and Rabbi Akiva's opinion is it's a shoe. And, and the sages apparently agree with him. Part two, totally different topic. And about the remains of a broken oven, that they must be four hand breaths high in order to retain impurity. Whereas they used to say three, and when he said four, they agreed with him. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Um, so the ovens of the ancient day. That's your oven, right? The, the oven was like this, you'd build a fire in here. Sometimes you'd burn things in or cook things inside, but very often the oven they're talking about are the bread ovens, and you'd slap your bread on the outside of the oven. Right? That's that's the way you make the best pita. Um, the question is about ritual impurity. If the oven, which was always made out of clay, becomes uh, in contact with something that causes ritual impurity, there is no way to kosher the oven. Right? Clay is like that. That's why it's like the least kosherable object around. However, there is something you can do regarding the ritual impurity of the oven, because now you've got an oven that's sitting there that's ritually impure, and, and what are you going to do with it, right? What do you do with it? You break it. When you break an object, the ritual impurity that it had contracted disappears. The question that Rabbi Akiva is trying to answer, what? Yeah, we talked about that before, exactly. Yeah, I don't know which 
quite a few because <laughs> it comes up fairly often about yeah, the idea of, of destroy it of, and rebuild it. Right. The most famous discussion of this is in the story of Tanur Shalachnai, um, where the guy was trying to build a pre-broken oven um, that you could disassemble if it ever came into contact with something that was ritually impure and then reassemble with a layer of sand beneath the different levels of the oven uh, in order to basically make it an indestructible uh, oven, uh, which the sages went, nope, and that doesn't work. Uh, but back to this, the question is, if I break it, how small do the pieces have to get to be considered broken enough that the ritual impurity goes away? And what Rabbi Akiva is saying is the pieces have to be um, uh, smaller or no larger than four handbreadths. <coughs> A handbreadth is this distance uh, of your hand, right? It's like you're measuring horses. Right? Isn't our horses like this or horses this way? Horses are that way, yeah? Right, they're, they're, they're like this, which makes a lot more sense, it's much easier. Um, so four of these, right, that's how big your oven could be, uh, the piece of the oven could be, and we still would call it broken and therefore no ritual impurity. Right, I, I know you may think that's a big oven, but th these things were large in the center of courtyards or in the middle of, uh, you know, people's large cooking areas. So the, they, weren't, they weren't tiny. Remember, they cooked every day. We, 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 you know, how often do you get a nice oven hot cooked meal? Uh, they cooked always, like every meal was basically either cold or oven cooked and it was all fresh ingredients from scratch, uh, which was a lot of work and a real pain, uh, but that's all they had. So this was a very relevant question. We uh, clear on his answer? Again, not exactly earth shattering, not groundbreaking. Uh... Come on, it's, it's ground, it's stonework. It... <laughs> well, <we're> they... <laughs> well, <were> they... <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> yeah. Well, were they breaking? Because I think they're trying to repair it after they broke it. Uh, well, th they might. And, and see, that's the tension that you have, right? Is if I am the owner of the oven, I know I have to break it, but I want to reassemble it. So I don't want to break it into too many pieces. And, and maybe if I can just sort of go beep and leave all the rest of it, then that would be the easiest thing altogether. Then I can just repair this little piece and I'm, I'm good. And that's why there needed to be a standard of broken in order for there to actually meaning behind this law. Uh, and Rabbi Akiva's was slightly more lenient than what the sages had done before him, right? Because they said three was the minimum. He said four. So they're actually taking off a whole, basically close to a whole side and then trying to put that whole side back on? No, because if you took off this side, this piece would still be ritually impure. Right, so you're breaking it into multiple pieces, and then you get to jigsaw it back together again. But each of those pieces can't be bigger than like about that. Don't you have to melt it? You know, make it into a ball to do it. No, nope, you can't. You can't reclay <laughs> clay. It's not like plastic. Well, right, you, you can't can grind it all off and well, well, <laughs> well, use it in the next phase of making pottery. Yes, uh, but that, that's not what they were talking about, right? So it would. Uh, it would just have been stuck back together again uh, oh. in order to be used a second time uh, because you would, you know, use other newer, softer clay to try and stitch it back together again, which is a pain, which is why you don't want to do it and why you don't want to have more cracks than necessary. Um, but well, that stuff was pretty breakable anyway. It was. A uh, little interesting archaeological note. Um, you will find um, in, in Israel and, and really all over the ancient Middle East, um, one of the most prolific things you'll find are pottery shards, not just because people had a lot of pots and they broke, but because that was their scrap paper. So you'll often find pottery shards with writing on it. Uh, and those that writing is because people would say, oh, you know, I broke my pot, but I'm not going to throw away all the pieces. I'm going to keep them as a notepad. And then I'll just take and I'll write on those, you know, three bushels of olives or, or whatever as a note for sales transactions or record keeping or things like that. So archaeologists love finding broken pottery because often it has writing on it and the writing is even more interesting than the pottery. I don't tell pottery experts I said that because they, they, they really like their pottery. But <laughs> <laughs> all power to the pottery experts, but the, the experts of pottery have really done a huge um, service for for world archaeology. It is a major, major uh, contribution. But some of us like writing better. Uh, okay, uh, part three. About a stool from which two of its covering boards had been removed, the one beside the other, 
which Rabbi Akiva pronounces able to contract impurity, but the sages declare unable to contract impurity. All right, remember our discussion of when is a chair a chair? <laughs> so this is going into another layer of detail of that, which is if you build a chair into the kneading, kneading trough and all of that, that, that's what we talked about before. This is the question of if I take this chair and imagine it's like one of those chairs that's built with slats at the bottom, right? They didn't have aluminum or steel or whatever this is made from. And I remove two of the three slats, and two, and the two that I remove are the ones that are next to each other, right? So I've left a giant, giant hole. Nobody's sitting in that chair happily now, right? Or, or really at all, because if you sit, there's just too much room for your tuchus. Uh, you can use for a bathroom. Yeah. But you can use for a bathroom. <laughs> you know, they didn't really do sit down toilets until until later um that that we yeah, it, it, I remember in Sabakam, we, we walk around we went to some place we fire something for against the flies uh -huh. and you can't sit comfortably <laughs> so it was a toilet for the portable a portable toilet yes yeah. so uh that is another use but it's still we wouldn't call it a chair we would call it a toilet uh but what what uh sorry what rabbi akiva was saying is that chair is still good enough much like your opinion and we can call that something that it could become ritually impure. It's not broken enough to no longer be uh, impurified. Whereas the sages went, no, that's no longer a chair, right? That That's a few sticks held together by one stick. And, and we're not gonna call that a chair. Therefore, it's not a complete item. It can't be, it can't contract ritual impurity. It, it's a broken chair. And you may like the broken chair. You may even find some use for the broken chair, but it's a broken chair, not a not a chair chair. Make sense? So it's no more it's not accept not not susceptible to ritual impurity. It can't be contaminated. And that is what the sages uh, ruled. So they agreed with him on two points, but on this point, eh, so Rabbi Akiva lost. That one would be easy to break and fix then, right? Uh, well, yes. I mean, things that were like that were, were, were very simple. But the question would be here is like, let's imagine someone has a broken chair and they decide not to fix it, but to use it for something else. Right. You know, maybe they're just putting their... their um, high on it to, to cool down or, or some other um, ancient practice. Uh, the question would be, could that chair become ritually impure, at which point it could make something else on it ritually impure? And, and what they're saying is, no, it doesn't matter. At that point, it's no longer really an intact chair. It's it's just a bunch of wood. And the rule was it had to be broken for the intent for which it was made for, right? Broken? Uh, well, in regards to the intent of portrait. I mean, it's the, the, the rules of purity are more detailed than that, but that's that's what we have at this particular discussion, is what they're talking about, yes. Uh, there, are, there are whole sections of the mission of the deal with ritual impurity that we'll probably never study because they are very intricate and, and mind-bending and not very applicable. Um, so we'll save that for the end when we finally decide that we want to really, really finish all the Mishnah and we've done all the other stuff, uh, then we'll, we'll loop back around and, and do that. All right, that brings us, uh, that was 2.8 to 2.9. And uh, Michelle, I think we're at you, yes? Yeah. Remember, you can always pass. <laughs> he used to say the father transmits to the son beauty, strength, wealth, wisdom, and years. Okay, so a little bit of uh, word of information. Um, the rabbis did not understand genetic theory. Right? This is ironically a very hot topic um, in modern um, discussion of what did the rabbis know and not know. Um, and there are many people who are trying to make rather unsubstantiated and outlandish claims that the rabbis knew all of modern genetic theory and they just coded it in language that we were too stupid to understand, but now we can see their brilliance. Um, as much as I respect the brilliance of the rabbis in all of the rather fields <coughs> of, of, of Jewish law, much of their science wisdom was informed by the wisdom of other people around them, not not by Torah, but by Greeks. other scientists. What's that? Greeks. Hmm? By the Greeks. By the Greeks uh, very much, uh, and, and later on by, by others as well. So to understand first and foremost what they thought of for, for humans, we have to understand that they believed that there was a seed. They got that right. But they believed the seed came from the man and only the man. Right, that the the woman was a um, was the the ground, um, and the man was the seed. And just as a seed will take some parts of the ground and, and use its own instructions to build, 
you know, a seed put into the ground will eventually become a tree, uh, and the seed put into a woman will eventually become a baby. But the dominant characteristics are those of the seed, not of the dirt. All right. So, and, and that was what all the ancient cultures that they lived among believed. Right? That was not a uniquely Jewish perspective of the biology of how babies are made. Um, that was the the universal belief of how babies were made in the ancient world. With that in mind, we then have to say, okay, so if a baby is made by the instructions of the father's seed and with the material of the mother's womb, which parts of the person are then attributable to to which, right? What is inherent within the the, the seed instructions and what is inherent in the materials that are being built with? Um, it'd be kind of like the question of, you know, if I, if I have instructions for building a house um, and I have a machine that will build the house, but I have to pour in the materials to the machine, if I pour in clay, I'm going to get one kind of a house. If I pour in steel, I'm going to get another kind of a house. This is trying to say basically what is influenced by the instructions and what is influenced by the materials. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I don't mean does it make sense scientifically. I mean, does it make sense of what their point of view was and therefore why Rabbi Akiva needed to make his statement? Because he needs to tell us what comes from dad. Right? What, what comes from dad very literally in the sense of which attributes of a person can we attribute uh, to the particular set of instructions that came with the father's seed? Why does it say father to son? Because obviously you could have had a daughter. Uh, because these are, the va these are the values that you would hope your son would have. You wouldn't necessarily wish for the same set of traits for your daughter. People didn't go around saying, I hope my daughter will be strong. I didn't even but necessarily we swear. Are we still uh, well, she wasn't responsible for generating wealth, mm -hmm. right? He was, and she wasn't responsible for generating wisdom in the classical model of the society of the day. Um, so the idea that these traits were uniquely masculine um, shows the the economic reality of the world that they lived in. Um, and again, we can disagree with that economic reality, and we have, which is why we live in a very different economic reality today. Um, but understanding what they saw and what they experienced helps us understand what they were teaching. Question again, or you would? Okay. okay. So, beauty, because the handsomeness uh, was uh, considered to be a good trait, uh, strength, wealth, wisdom, and years. Um, all of those were considered to be a very uh, important trait for, for any young man. Uh, and we can see that all of them, according to Rabbi Akiva, came from the father exclusively, right? You look like your dad, not you're handsome like your mom. Okay. That, that was the perception of the time. Yes, and we can say, you know, both personal experience as well as modern genetics say that that's not always true, but culturally that is what people felt. We do see a little bit of that, even still in the modern world. One of the most common things to say when a baby is born is to find some feature that looks like the father and to point that out very, very quickly. Uh, that, that's not quite as common as it used to be, but um, that there actually have been studies around these things, um, that it used to be someone would say, oh, it's such a cute baby you've got there. He's got your eyes. Therefore, don't, don't imagine your wife was fooling around on you. Right? That, that, that is one of the underlying concerns, right? Is that uh, if the baby doesn't look like the father, that there is concern that maybe the father ain't the father. Uh, I, I remember there was even one study done that said that for like the first three months, six months, a baby would often look um, more like the father than the mother, uh, including girls. Uh, that, I mean, because obviously babies boys, girls, there, there really is no difference unless people put those stupid bows in their hair um, or, or the little bandana bows if they don't have hair. It's like, please, it's, <laughs> I'm not trying to marry your daughter. So just, you don't need to advertise that she's that she's a female, but, um, and genetically the, the supposition is that babies will look a little bit more like the father right after they're born in order to assuage the fears of who the father might actually be. Uh, but that was only one study I read a long time ago. I have no idea if it's still considered valid or if it was ever um, verified by anyone else. But I have noticed a lot of people will go to, to great lengths to find some attribute about a newborn baby that they will then say, it looks like dad. Because uh, no one ever doubts that it came from mom, but people might doubt where it came from when it comes to the father. Not that they would ever say such a thing. <laughs> uh, okay. Then we're going to get a... Oh, sorry. The, the years... Uh, refer to long, 
longevity. Longevity, exactly. Yeah. Your yeah. lifespan, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, although we're now going to get a an interesting midrash on, on what that means. Um, so if you can continue for the next piece. And the number of generations before him that shall be their appointed end, for it is okay. then. Which okay. makes no sense, right? That, that phrase, the commentators have just banged their head on for well, about almost 2,000 years uh, of what does this mean, right? The number of generations before him, that shall be their appointed end. Hold on a second. I had a different translation that I was looking up that did it a little differently. Give me a second. I just want to show you the variety. Uh, the number, I'm with, with the number of generations before him, and it is the end, mm. which also is not um, much. Do you have a trend? Does anyone else have another translation, or is yours the Hebrew only? Yeah. Natan, does yours have a translation? I think this one's different. Oh, no, that's the that's the commentary, not the yes. not. The, do you have a translation? Wow, no, the same. Okay, same. All right. So, anyways, they're going to give an explanation using some midrash, uh, and then we will come back to what this verse might actually, what this uh, teaching might actually mean. So, go ahead and read the the verse. Uh, for it is said. For it is said, calling to generations from the beginning. And go ahead and continue. Although it is said, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And read the. It is also said, and it, and in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. Okay, so basically the the question here is one of fate, right? How much of the child's life is determined by the father? And so there are various interpretations of this. One of them is to say that yes, the father influences the longevity. It's not up to just whether you're a good person or not. Remember that uh, in many interpretations of different passages of the Torah, the better person you are, the longer you'll live. Uh, but it was also a question of the generations who came before you, um, what we call zechut avot, the merit of our ancestors. Um, this is something that we talk about every time we do the Amidah and we read from the avot, the first blessing of the Amidah, that that also would sustain. But the idea here saying that you are going to get some benefit from your ancestors and some benefit from your dad also leads us to say, well, if I'm getting benefit from my ancestors or if I'm getting benefit from my father, why do things suck, right? Why are bad? Why am I having bad things, right? Well, why, why are things not perfect then if I've got all of this lovely positive baggage? And that's where the next quote is coming here which is, of course, the quote that is talking to Abraham when God promises Abraham this wonderful offspring and the, you know, they'll be in their enemy's gates and they're going to have great you know, uh, stars of the heaven and all of that. And then he tells them, and they're going to be afflicted for 400 years. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I, I thought the promise was for good stuff. What, what's, what's this stuff? And that's why God says, and then after the 400 years, they'll be brought out, right, to say that, the the blessing that is being promised here is not a consistent, uninterrupted, um, un, unvariable uh, blessing. This is a blessing that will go up and down. This is a blessing that is less predictable from the human's um, perspective on uh, on life as well as the scope of time. And this is more of a general uh, impression rather than a specific guarantee. Right? God is not guaranteeing certain things. He is simply saying things have been tilted in the right direction, and eventually it will work out positively. Like I said, it's a really confusing section of the Mishnah, and the commentators have lots to say about it. Any more questions or in your own interpretations for tonight? Okay. 210. Hmm? One. Yeah. Also, he used to say that our five that our, there are five <clears throat> things that last twelve months. The judgment of the generations of the flood continued twelve months. All right. So th this means the the flood itself uh, was for um, for twelve twelve months. We'll come back to that in just a second. I want to go through the list just so we have it in mind. Number two, the judgment of Job. Job. 
Yo. Yeah, that's one of those great English words, right? Io. Yo. <laughs> that's why I always prefer the Hebrew names because they're just easier, Yo. clearer. <laughs> Uh, continue 12 months. Right, in case you ever wondered when you were reading the book of EO, which you should do if you've never done it, um, how long was you going through this? It was 12 months long. Uh, the judgment of the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Continue right. 12 months. Which we would call the Exodus, right? The Makot, the plagues that, that hit uh, Exodus. That was a 12 month period. So from when Moses showed up, until we finally left, that was 12 months. Right? It wasn't like day one, blood, day two, right? right. It, it, the, these were spread out over the course of a year. Uh, we can look at some of the, the commentary in a second. So the commentary explains, but this is the, the short mnemonic from Rabbi Akiva of these 12 things, and then the, uh, these things had 12 months. And then we'll look at the commentary to, to see the proof texts. Number four. The judgment of Gog and Magog in the time to come will continue 12 months. Right, so this is from the book of Yechezkel, the book of Ezekiel. Um, and in that, it says there will be a war with Gog, and Gog comes from Magog, right? Magog is his country, Gog is the person, and that whole battle will last 12 months. Onward. Uh, the judgment of the wicked in Gehenna continues 12 months. Right, so this is the judgment of the afterlife, right? For when people die having done bad things for which they didn't do tshuva, in which they didn't um, prepare, um, their punishment will last 12 months. Oh, so only 12 months. <laughs> <laughs> why do you think we say, why do you think we say Kaddish for our parents for the year? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ah, so the custom is to say it for only 11 months because who gets 12 months? Yeah, the wicked. Are you saying your mother and father are wicked? <laughs> right? So it would be considered shameful to say the Kaddish as a way of helping them through the, the punishment period. It would be shameful if you were to do that for the whole 12 months, because that would seem to imply that you thought they needed every single piece of help that they could possibly get because they were the most wicked of wicked. On the other hand, doing it less, right? would also perhaps shortchange them of benefit that you could be helping with, um, and therefore would also be not the proper behavior of a child. Uh, and so the custom has become 11 months. Uh, but in, in some communities, they do go the full 12, just because how could you ever shortchange your parents? Uh, and, Which uh, community? And some of the Sephardim. Yeah, in Ashkenazim, it's universal 11 months, yeah. but there are some Sephardim that I've heard that are, are 12. Right. Which I, I don't remember. Uh, it's, it's one thing that I've heard. It's not something I've ever had from a person uh, face to face. Uh, For it is said, and it will be one month until its same month. Isaiah 66. Right. So at the very end of Isaiah, uh, I mean the end of the book of Isaiah, when he talks about the, the end of everything and everybody coming uh, to God, he uses this phrase from month to month, which is why we read it on Rosh Chodesh as the Haftorah. Um, and what the uh, what Akiva is saying here is that when it says from month to month, he means from this month to that to the same month, meaning one year. One year alone. Right. right? It's not from October to November or, or from, uh, you know, Nissan to Iyar. It, it is from Nissan to yeah. Nissan. Yeah. Okay. However, Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri. Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri says, as long as from Passover to Shavuot, or it is said, and from one Shabbat until its next Shabbat. All right. So the... The connection between the idea of Shabbat being the day after Passover, the beginning of the counting of the Omer, uh, until Shavuot, um, is a little bit beyond the scope of our discussion. Um, but it's it's how we end up with counting the Omer from second night Pesach rather than waiting till Shabbat of Pesach. It actually makes perfect sense, especially if you look at the parallel text in the Book of Joshua. Um, but what he's saying is that because it says Shabbat to Shabbat, that could mean that there are some people whose punishment is only 
the 49 length of the 49 days of the counting of the Omer. So yes, some people's punishment is for an entire year and some people's punishment is only for 49 days, right? It's not one size fits all. Okay, so let's go back and unpack some of the proof texts of these because it's, it's interesting and because we are definitely not starting chapter three tonight because the first Mishnah in chapter three is very, very complicated and long. Um, so let's go ahead and use our time that we have left to, to look at a little bit more of how these uh, Midrashim work. So the generation of the flood, meaning the, uh, the deluge of Noah. Um, how do we know this lasted for 12 months? Well, because it says uh, from Genesis 7, 11, if you do the math to Genesis 8 to 14, it ends up to be one year and 10 days later. That is not a coincidence, but it's something that most of us would never notice because what is 10 days shorter than 365 days? 12 moon cycles, exactly, right? This is the difference between a lunar year and a solar year. And what they're saying here is that in the book of Noah, sorry, in the story of Noah itself is that it lasted one solar year. Um, it doesn't sound like that when you read through the book of Noah because it doesn't say one solar year, but because it, it goes for uh, 10 days longer than one year, that tells us that it happened to be a full solar cycle. Uh, and that's, of course, how we know that it was a 12 month um, flood um, between the beginning and the end of the flood. Uh, and Noah was only 600 years old at the time. <laughs> All right, part two, the judgment of Job. Uh, is a little bit different. All right, so if you read, again, we're looking at the commentary at the bottom. Uh, in Job 7.3, it states, So I have been allotted months of futility, nights of misery have been apportioned to me. All right, so the way the Midrash works, the months of futility are the days of summer, which are long, and the nights of misery, which are also long. All right, together, if you add summer plus winter, that's considered to be a year's cycle, right? Because those are the two opposing ends of the uh, of the seasonal um, spectrum. It's like saying top and bottom. We include the middle. Make sense? Okay. Uh, and then the ten plagues. How do we know this? Again, Exodus five twelve in the Midrash um, says that according to the verse, the plagues began only after the Egyptians forced the Israelite slaves to search for their own straw. Since straw is found in the month of Iyar, May, and the Israelites left Egypt in Nisan, which is the month right before May, April, or so right before Iyar, that means that the plagues must have lasted a full year. Again, fairly logical, yes? Okay. Uh, and then Gog and Mogog. Um, so according to Ezekiel 38 and 39, we'll have this great battle, this great fight, and... Uh, the Midrash on Isaiah 18.6 comes to tell us the kites shall summer on them and all the beasts of the earth shall winter of them. Again, we have summer, we have winter, we've got a year. Uh, and then, as I mentioned already, the, the phrase for how long the wicked are in Gehinom being 12 months, that's connected to the last um, of the book of Isaiah um, and trying to say that the month to month means the month to its same month in the next year. Very logical. All right. And with that, we will have to uh, say goodbye to chapter two, uh, and we will save the very long and complicated chapter three for next week. Any other questions or comments on this chapter? Once, twice, so. Yeah, I found it.